all like a great story. A great story captures our attention, pulls us in, captures our imagination, and evokes strong emotions that help us connect to the characters and their experiences. So, how can you tell such a story about yourself or your organization? In this episode of Humans Now and Then, I speak to Gordon Locke, president of Pace Communications, about the importance of effective storytelling and how strong emotion compels us to connect to and believe in the stories that we hear. The emotion plays a strong role in how we react to things. And then moments later, that rational part of our brain can either choose to reject or accept that initial impulse. And, and that's really the fundamental basis of whether stories that you hear, you believe, and whether you connect with them. Gordon Price Locke is a veteran of storytelling and an expert on emerging trends and technology in the brand story space. He's president of one of the largest independent agencies in North America, Pace, specializing in integrated marketing and brand story development. Gordon has served as VP, SVP, and CMO in marketing and communication roles with leading brands such as Hawaiian Airlines. So, ready to discuss how effective storytelling can elevate your brand? Let's discuss. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. Gordon Locke, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Rebecca. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on. So I think the journey that you're on with your marketing company is something that really demonstrates the dawn of a different age of marketing. We're really starting to acknowledge a little bit more about our own humanity and how that factors into the markets that different organizations are, are in and how they connect and build relationships with their customers. And I think it's fascinating stuff. But before we dive into the meat of that conversation, I'd love for you to give a bit of an overview about your company pace to get the listeners a little bit of an introduction to the work that you do. Sure. Well, I have the honor and privilege of serving as president and chief marketing officer for Pace Communications. We're a North Carolina-based company, but we do work nationally and globally. And our forte is integrated brand storytelling. And what I mean by that is really the fabric of content and stories and storylines that a brand may strategically deploy to develop better connections with the consumers that they want to buy their products, whether that's business to consumer or business to business. And we really dwell heavily in the data insights and strategic arena of storytelling quite deeply before we get into doing the storytelling, which is what makes Pace very unique in its application of using storytelling as a marketing tool, both in digital, but also still uh, helping some brands with traditional print storytelling, which plays a role in, in many cases, that tangible story. So yeah, that's that's basically what Pace does. We're uh, a wonderful agency. We have hundreds of employees. Most are storytellers by nature, journalists, writers, visualists, and uh, they all stay on top of emerging storytelling trends as well, which is really fun. We get to see a lot of experimental work done in our studio and take that to our customers as something for them to consider as well. I love that. Experimenting and starting to think about it from an innovative perspective. How do you introduce new ways of doing things in the marketing realm so businesses can stand out, which is definitely a challenge that all organizations face in our current world, not even just with the speed of business and so forth, but we've got so many marketing channels available and people are receiving messages from every direction on every moment of every day. And the number of messages that we receive is profoundly huge. And it's just getting more and more as we introduce more options for Internet of Things, as we navigate through our world. It's changed significantly over time and it will continue to change. And I think, you know, the fact that we've been isolated over the last, you know, year or so in relation to the pandemic has really modified our behaviors and made us think very much differently about the world that we're in and how we navigate that world. And so maybe I'd like to know your thoughts around that the disruption of the past year and how that's factored into your approach to marketing. Sure. Well, and I think it's good to take a step back from that and understand generally what we're talking about across the the human landscape, or as we like to say in marketing, the consumer landscape. But if you think about this, you know, as the pandemic set in, many of us were in denial uh, or had some suspended belief systems around what that may or may not mean for us. And the, the reason that 
what's happening is there that we live in a world where there's so many things that are vying for our attention and we feel like there's so many things that we have to worry about. And the bottom line here is all of us will encounter thousands of brands in our lifetime, thousands of stories, thousands of brands. The science around it is absolutely amazing and what we as humans encounter in our life. So whether you look at the pandemic as now a branded horrible event, right? Because it has a name, it has a story, it has sort of a timestamp. It's something we have a relationship with, but we have thousands of those opportunities in a lifetime. And we really only develop meaningful attachments to a few of them. And I think the question is, why is that? And I think That really is around behavioral science. And it shows us that every human impulse is driven by emotion and then seconds later by the rational part of our brain. So, again, we're living in a world right now, and it won't be the last time that it happens, and it wasn't the first, where the emotion plays a strong role in how we react to things. And then moments later, that rational part of our brain can either choose to reject or accept that initial impulse. And, and that's really the fundamental basis of whether stories that you hear, you believe, and whether you connect with them. You know, so this cognitive bias that we have around the world around us has a tremendous impact on how we digest information, how we consider products, how we choose to buy into something or not, whether it's a concept, service, or product. And storytelling is at the center of all of that. I love how you've weaved in that topic of the science of storytelling, which is a fascinating topic. And I know that's a huge area of interest that you have as well. Obviously, storytelling has been a part of human history for many years. And what's really interesting to think about how that's really been ingrained and how we have come to this time in in our, our modern world. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts around how that history of human storytelling really factors into today's world. No, absolutely. So I'll I'll put a couple concepts out there and then I'll go a little bit into just what's sort of packed in my brain around this. (laughs) So for anyone listening to this, I think when they think about, gosh, you know, what's happening today, such an extreme version of feeling disconnected. And, you know, when we look back over centuries, storytelling's happened on the walls of caves through short form stories with carrier pigeons and relays across large countries, stories being handed down from one runner or horseback rider to the next. And you only hope that how the story started in one town is the same by the time it gets to where it was intended. What makes stories work, whether it's today or uh, in the past, are sort of three things. People are looking for, is it relevant? Do they feel an emotional connection? and Does it feel authentic to that person? That's what causes that purpose. Mm -hmm. So I think every story that works, whether it's short or long, is around whether it has a strong red thread of purpose and it answers the why for the listener. And, you know, the other aspect of this is decades of research has been into behavioral economics. And that has proven that humans are irrational, emotional creatures. I think we've all seen evidence of that in 2020 and 2021. But at the bottom line is, when you think about the pandemic or you think about other times in history where people have felt separated physically, we crave relationships, we travel in packs, we form families, we treat our household pets as royalty, and we don't limit our relationships just to humans and animals. Even more broadly, we form relationships with ideas and things. So The evolution of storytelling, I mean, the science that makes a great story arc, um, or the science of how the human brain uses cortisol, dopamine, and, you know, oxytocin to, to really connect with what someone's saying to you or what you're reading hasn't changed. The methodology and the medium has changed. And what we found during this pandemic is that digital connections are critical and it can be replicated, right? So that feeling of belonging, that feeling of empathy, which comes with the oxytocin in your brain, a feeling of empathizing and connecting with people, dopamine, which sort of regulates your emotion around things, and cortisol, which helps with memories. You know, you're still in this day and age with great stories, if they're done well, of doing something that an an author, Eric Motley, said in one of his interviews. So Eric is with the Aspen Institute and wrote a book, Madison Park, A Place of Hope. 
he boiled it down to relationships, experiences, and memories. So if you think about what you experience on a day-to-day basis and what resonates with you, it's really about, do I have a relationship with that story or that topic or that person or that ideal? Is the experience good for me? And am I going to remember it? Is it attaching itself to that part of my brain that creates positive memories? So all those things are in play right now. I just think it's happening differently because the digital nature of what we're all going through right now has been forced down our throat, right? You know, it was just the internet at one point. Now it's really the way we're living and interacting with people largely. Long answer. Yeah, no, it's a great answer. It's a great answer. It made me really think about the way that I view different brands, how I attach to their stories, how I relate to those stories and how I'm moved by those stories. Yes. And I can think about some examples of different brands that have had that impact on me and other people. I think brands that have done this well are like Nike, right? Nike really connects with people's ability to think about their well-being and what people can achieve at their best, which is a very powerful brand image. But You know, another interesting story that I'd be interested to know what you think about is I was thinking about Zoom. So a lot of people, you know, obviously are using Zoom these days with the pandemic. Some people had never heard of Zoom before the pandemic. And now, like, my parents are a great example. Like, they had no idea that these technologies really even existed. And now they're using Zoom like it's no big deal. What I thought about is, like, I'm not really feeling very attached to that Zoom brand, to be honest. Like it's been a meta need. So which means that other technologies that you see commercials about, like Microsoft Teams, they tell a more of a compelling story about how people connect and how it helps people meet a need, but also how it helps them tell their story. And I'm wondering your thought around that opportunity or that potential opportunity missed that these brands that have been amplified because of the pandemic are they missing a moment that could really allow them to get people really attached to their brand in the long term? Well, it's a great question. And I, and I will tell you that for most brands, there's something that at Pace we borrow from a great song, Stairway to Heaven, that we call there's that stairway to heaven from brand awareness to brand attachment. Brand attachment is hard to earn, but you can see the brands that earn it Uh, have done it with their consumers over time. So whether we're talking about Apple or Harley Davidson or Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop, I mean, they've just got very attached uh, brand fans. Um, USAA, Amazon, Burt's Bees, Patagonia, Toms of Maine, we can all see these types of brands that you just, you develop an attachment for, but we have to really unpack what attachment needs. And we really think about that as an emotional and cognitive connection that someone creates with a brand. It really enables someone to feel a sentiment that is making that brand feel like an extension of themselves. I'd say that's probably the best way. I see myself in that brand. Therefore, that brand is me and I am that brand and I'm attached. But what comes before that is brand awareness tends to move into brand familiarity and people will default out from familiarity, whether they create some sort of next stage thing, which is affinity and then, then loyalty, right? So loyalty can be functional. It can be purchased through rewards points or whatever. And we've seen that whether it's your zoom example or whether it's your favorite grocery store and you move to a new neighborhood, brand loyalty becomes an interesting thing. So, you know, I uh, have always shopped at whole foods traditionally, but I also shopped with another brand, Fresh Market, which has a you know similar profile, but it's not owned by Amazon. And for me, that local sort of regional market is something that I feel attached to. And I never had a Fresh Market near me. I recently moved away from a neighborhood that had a Whole Foods and closer to one that had a Fresh Market. I'm not driving back to Whole Foods because I didn't develop brand attachment. And there really wasn't much of a loyalty program, if you think about it either, other than that great food, great quality, great people, and that type of dynamic. But brand attachment is really when the consumer feels that positive, unfailing attachment to a brand. They'll go out of their way to stay connected to it. So I think with your example with Zoom, I would say that some of the tools that we're using have done a better job than others making them feel like an essential part of someone's lives. And it might start with, hey, which one's functionally better? Which one has more tools for filters and can make me look great and sound wonderful? 
or how can you have a party with 20 people on this application versus another, which one's better at it. But eventually it just becomes a preference, right? And as long as that brand doesn't disrupt a consumer's trust, uh, they stay authentic and they remain relevant, then they stand a higher chance of developing some attachment to it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I think there's a lot of really interesting use cases out in the world that would demonstrate that. Think about Amazon. You know, obviously Amazon has done many things brilliantly well, but it's not that a lot of people say, I love Amazon as a company. You know, Amazon doesn't necessarily have that touchy feely kind of thing to it. But what Amazon does, of course, is is meets a need of convenience, especially during the pandemic. And that's why they have just exploded, because, you know, you can go to Amazon and you can order something and you can get it within two days with free shipping if you have a prime membership. And and that's something that is important to a lot of people right now is the convenience factor. I can find anything that I want on Amazon and I can have it shipped to me quickly. And um, it's difficult for other folks to compete with that. But there's also this aspect of, like you said, the brand attachment, but also this emotional aspect. There's an emotional aspect of thinking about how do I support local businesses? And you had mentioned that too, is like the fresh market versus whole foods example, even though fresh market is a chain, you've got these local businesses that you see and you feel and you're like, I want to support these local businesses. And I do that and I'll go to my local downtown area and I'll shop those businesses and feel really good about the fact that I'm helping actual families in my community. And yes, that might be something that a lot of other people feel and start to drive their purchasing decisions based on that emotional connection and more of a purpose-driven approach to finding the things that they need out in the world. Well, and I think it, it gets back down to the stories we tell and the stories that matter to us. I mean, consumers can defy logic and follow their heart or emotions as long as the brand continues to provide satisfaction. And I think that, you know, we know that the same types of mental states that occur between humans can also happen between a human and a brand. So there's scientific evidence that something deeper is going on at a subconscious emotional level between brands and certain audiences. So with the Amazon example, one side of your brain may be saying, I want to support local business, but the other side of your brain may be saying, you know, Amazon has opened a regional distribution hub and is really lower the level of unemployment in an area too, right? So it just depends on what part of the story resonates with you as to whether your rational or irrational brain will guide you toward Amazon. I've ordered a mirror for my house uh, several months ago through Amazon. It came and it was broken. Ordered and ordered it again. It came and it was broken. I started thinking, okay, well, <laughs> something's wrong with the packaging. Now, I haven't had that happen before with Amazon. And then you think, is it UPS? Is it FedEx? Is it what's causing this? Well, you know, I just drove out to Home Goods and bought a mirror, right? Right. It's 30 minutes away from from my house and I had it in an hour and I'm fine. Does it mean that I don't use Amazon anymore? No. I mean, I think that the story they tell as a company seems rational to me. I feel somewhat attached to them from a convenience perspective and they're just a go-to brand for certain things that I that I want. But there are other things that I know that just aren't going to work and when I have an opportunity to support, you know, and this will probably make you laugh, but there's a, a local brand here in North Carolina of pickled okra. I love it. I won't buy anybody else's pickled okra. I'm not going to go buy it online and have it shipped to me or anything because I want to buy it from a local store because the person who makes it lives here and it's just kind of cool, right? So I think those kinds of things happen in our life, but it's rooted in story. You know, I think another thing that's important to talk about is as consumers develop attachment to a brand, I think it's important to also examine what can brands do or what are they doing that causes that right kind of emotional connection. And I think it's working through the right story arcs. Sometimes you don't know you're being told a story, right? And other times you're stopping and watching a video or you're actually hearing a story or reading something in long form. But stories can happen in seconds or they can happen over a matter of weeks and months or it can be like seeing a movie. But I think, you know, what I would share with you is, again, we've talked about Zoom and Amazon, lots of other great brands I've mentioned. What I think a lot of them get right, though, is they understand that when they tell a story, whether they do it accidentally or whether they do it on purpose, they got to follow the science of what a great story arc is. I mean, you and I both sit through probably a lot of presentations that are flat and boring and they're PowerPoint slides. And we know that in a business context, 
that when someone conveys something to you in the form of a, a good story, you tend to listen better and remember it more. And I think that's when you think about a story arc, the author or the storyteller laying the groundwork, which a brand needs to do, lay the groundwork for your stories. That's called exposition or stasis typically. And then there's that rising action, the climax, falling action and resolution. And that's something that's been proven over time that humans respond to. You know, one of my favorite movies that does the story arc well is Fried Green Tomatoes. You know, I, w- I wish every brand that wanted to do short and long form storytelling would just make their marketing team sit down and watch the movie and t- pay attention to how the story arcs work. And I think there are 11 different story arcs that I've been able to identify if it, within that one movie. So you've got that overarching sort of story but then you've got subplots, right? And complexity within it. I mean, that's what captures your attention and makes you laugh, cry, get angry, feel put off, feel bought in. And, you know, most people who've watched that movie probably have wanted to watch it three or four times. Because every time you watch it, you get a different, different story, but it's all connected and hangs well together. You can do a story just as powerful as fried green tomatoes in 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You can do it three minutes or five minutes, or you can do a long form documentary. But that is really the epitome of, I think, what people are looking for in a good story, especially when we're disconnected physically from each other much more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I can relate to that when I'm thinking through, you know, those powerful stories that have brought emotion whether it be happiness, whether it be sadness, whether it be whatever it might be. I'm one of those people that cry commercials, right? (laughs) So maybe that's a good indicator if a commercial is good or powerful because you're going to have me tear up and my kids make fun of me. That's that's another story altogether. Yeah. But there's something to be told about invoking an emotional reaction from a story that's being told, whether it be in a commercial, whether it be in print, whether it be a movie, there's something there is that we're connecting to that story. And that's where that attachment starts to build. It's kind of like your um, your meeting example. If you're listening to a PowerPoint presentation and you're not feeling anything, you're probably going to tone out. You're probably not going to connect to what's being said. It's not going to be meaningful. It's not going to have staying power. It's not going to be something you think about later and be like, wow, that was a moment. That was something that I remember that stuck with me. That's something that connected with something that's important to me somewhere inside. Right. And I think thinking about it in those terms would be really powerful for for many organizations, whether they're large or small, local or national or international, figuring out who your audience is, being able to connect to them personally in that level uh, is pretty powerful stuff. Well, and I would encourage listeners to this podcast to also just check out another example, which can, they can Google it, or if you want to take a look at it later. But you know, this past year, uh, BB&T, which is a regional bank, now merged with SunTrust, its truest financial, one of the country's largest bank. Where I'm going with that is BB&T has a number of bank cards, and they came to our agency to develop um, what would be considered sort of a long-form story, two or three-minute video for web release through YouTube, what have you, and some cut downs for broadcast. So we worked with them to develop a story called Life Changing Decisions. So anyone listening to this can go to Google, just type in Life Changing Decisions, BB&T. And when you do that, you'll get a link uh, to go watch this short video. It's won several Addy Awards. And I will guarantee you it will be very difficult for anyone to watch this without smiling and wanting to just have a little bit of a happy cry right towards the end because it really plays off the science of a story arc it's authentic it's real it's something that most people will be able to identify with and it basically takes a couple who met at a very young age through their life through having a daughter with the subplot of photography and memories and life-changing decisions you all make and how the BBNT bank card you know can help you through those different points in your life it's a happy story it's well done we used one of the directors from This Is Us, uh, which you can imagine that adds a lot of emotion to anything. But it's a great, great example of how to use a story arc to tell a story that as a watcher of this video, 
we're tapping cortisol, dopamine, and oxytocin. <laughs> All those things start happening, and it's just in a matter of minutes that you go for a really fun, happy ride through this couple's life, having a daughter, and then having a nice little teary moment at the end. So just an example there, since we talked about fried green tomatoes, which anyone can go see or rent or download, an actual brand example would be, be the one that I'm talking about. Absolutely. So I just Googled it real quick so I could take a look at, you know, the length and things. It's only just over two minutes long. Yeah. And so thinking about that from a marketing perspective, asking only two minutes of your you know, potential customers to watch a video that invokes a moment for them, it, it's powerful stuff. And that does start to get people to think differently, especially if you're a bank. I know for, for me, I think of a bank, it's not like I get really excited about banks, <laughs> right. but if you connect them to your life or to an emotional, you know, visceral reaction uh, to a story, then that bank starts to take a different life or that, that brand starts to take a different life. And that's when you start to find, I imagine, more of that attachment to that brand or recognition of that brand, because you'll tie that back to the emotional reaction you've had to the video. And I will go watch this, you know, after we're done talking here, because I'm really interested to, to learn more about that too. But I think another thing that's really cool about what you're doing at Pace as I went to poke around your, your website, and what I thought was really neat is that you've carried forward this idea about storytelling to um, how you, you think about your workforce, so the people that are working at Pace. So many times you go to an organization's website, you read about the people, you read about their, their background, you might get a little blurb here and there about their family or things like that. But what you've done here is really identified them first as people who really care about the work that they do, and then a little bit about what they do within your organization. So I think that's really a cool integration of what your company does for your clients with how you approach uh, the people within your organization. Well, thank you. I mean, we do a lot of work for wonderful brands, but you know, we are a brand also. So at Pace, we've had a unique culture that survived over 40 years, and it's very entrepreneurial, but it's really based on accountability transparency, honor, and trust. And those are the things that brands with the highest levels of attachment all have in common out in the marketplace. So as an agency, while we're not a consumer brand and we're not some massive global B2B brand, we have found that our employees stay three times longer than the average agency and our clients also stay three times longer. You know, most agencies churn through clients on a two to three year basis. You know, we've got clients who have stayed seven, eight, nine, 10, up to 20 years simply because we continue to be transparent and evolve and honor the craft of storytelling and content making in a way that puts the talent of our employees first. So I think that we are storytellers, we hire storytellers, and that's who we bring to the table. And it allows us to have fun with our work. And, you know, we're not a traditional advertising agency. We're not a public relations firm. Those have their place. But I, I like to say, Rebecca, that I don't know anyone who's ever said they want to see another advertisement, but I know a lot of people that have said they want to hear another story. <laughs> so that's sort of what we trade in. Yeah, that's powerful right there. I, I love that. If we could think about marketing differently in that regard, it's, it's a different experience that we're all going to have with that. So, um, and I think that's something that, you know, organizations are going to have to challenge themselves with more and more as we go into the future, because as we get hit by more and more messages, you don't want to just be another message that hits somebody, you know, at a bad time of the day or whatever it might be, because that's not going to elicit the response that you're looking for as a business. But if you think about the connection that you can build with each person that hears your story and they can relate to you and they can relate to your brand and understand your purpose and the difference that you can make sometimes with that customer by meeting a need, but also sometimes with the world, like what difference will that company make in the world? Boy, that is a profound difference in how that individual respond to that message that they've received. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm interested to know, when we think a little bit forward into the future, what is something that you are optimistic about for the future? Oh, wow. So much. You know, I think that for the future, whether that's individuals, consumers, all of us humans out there, or whether it's companies and brands, I just feel like there's just been this real authentic call to action around purpose. We've all heard about things that are related to purpose, you know, social impact, sustainability, doing the right thing, being part of your community, doing philanthropic 
work, donating money, all these things are out there and they're all part of marketing. But I think what all of us can look forward to as individuals and as brands is the call to action around purpose means that there's just much more accountability and I believe transparency on the way. That's largely because data and the technology that's out there, the types of news media reporting that's out there, people doing consumer crafted content, social channels just mean that everything's just out there on on your sleeves every day. But I think what it all means is, generally speaking, I feel brands are entering an age where purpose means more than brand washing around, oh, we did something cool for somebody or we donated money or our people built a house. You know, it, you know, those incidental things, and it's evolved more into what do you stand for as a brand? Or maybe what do we stand for as individuals? And how do we attach ourselves to those brands and activities and experiences that represent our purpose and our why? Because I think if you know your why as an individual, then it's much easier to understand why you get connected and attached to certain brands. And for me and many others, it's because you start to see when you peel back the layer of the onion that certain brands and companies are doing the right thing and they're living their purpose. A company I would encourage several people to look at, someone that I used to work with many moons ago, Alicia Tillman, who is the CMO of SAP. I feel that that brand with her team and with the executive team at SAP, they are not just talking about purpose, they're doing purpose. It's actually manifesting itself in what they believe and what they stand for that they do as a company for other companies who use their software and platforms and what they want to give back to the world. I think there are a lot of companies like that. I think there are a lot of easy ones to point to, You know, whether it's Patagonia or other brands that we've all certainly seen function with purpose. But I also think there's many more out there than we, than we realize. So Rebecca, I guess long answer to, to a simple question is, I feel that purpose-driven stories, purpose-driven action, and the ability for people to impact other people and the planet and the world we live in is, is going to get easier because of digitalization of the world and because there are many more options to make a difference, either locally or regionally or nationally or globally as an individual or as a brand. So that's what I look forward to. And I think how it's going to come to life is going to be quite interesting. Absolutely. What I love about you weaving in purpose here is that not only, as you mentioned, will that keep brands moving forward or organizations moving forward, because companies really need to have an overarching purpose that they drive towards to continue to move forward and not lose their way, so to speak. But people are the same way. If we lose our sense of purpose, or if that becomes fuzzy to us, we start to lose our way. We don't understand the path that we need to take to go forward, and we lose some of our motivation. Uh, So I think defining our purpose, defining our story, figuring out how do we achieve our purpose, or how do we contribute to a purpose greater than ourselves, whether it be greater than ourselves as individuals or as companies, maybe a purpose that can change the world, like Patagonia's purpose in relation to the environment and nature and things like that. We can connect to that and we can work towards that. That's powerful stuff. That keeps us moving forward. That gives us a feeling that what we're doing makes a difference. Powerful stuff. Very important. Right. Absolutely. Gordon Locke, this has been a fabulous, awesome conversation. And I want folks to be able to go out and find your company. So you go out to paceco.com and you can learn all about the amazing work that Gordon and Pace is doing in relation to marketing. And I think it's what they're doing is fascinating. They're doing very innovative stuff. But I think I also want to challenge people to think about their own stories, whether that be a story for your organization, if you're an entrepreneur, or if you're a leader in an organization, or you are just an individual in the world. I want to challenge you to think about what your story is. How would you tell your own story and how would you define and articulate your purpose? Because I think that is a powerful exercise for anybody to do. So Gordon Locke, this has been a fabulous conversation. Thanks so much for joining me. Rebecca, thank you. It's been totally enjoyable and have a great day. Thanks, you too. Gordon Locke shares a compelling story about his company's brand, their mission, and how effective storytelling is critical in creating strong connection. From movies like Fried Green Tomatoes to brands like Patagonia, 
The common thread lies in the ability to invoke emotion that helps us connect to the story in a way that makes us feel like we're a part of it, that we could be characters in that story, or even just conscious and active observers of an experience that transcends our own. As many episodes have done in the past, this episode challenged me to think more deeply about my own story and my own purpose. There is the thing that you likely know. I have a purpose to help inspire others like yourself to shape a better future. But if I'm being honest, there's much more to my story, and my purpose is broader than that. I'm a mother, a wife, a sister, a daughter, an artist, and a writer. I hold the purpose of raising my children in a way that helps them achieve a fulfilling life. I maintain my well-being and hopefully in doing so, encourage others to do the same. I lived a story that invokes hope, struggle, overcoming the impossible, and striving to make a difference. What's great about our own stories is that we are able to use them to express why we do the work we do, what's important to us, and fundamentally who we are. We have the ability to create, or at least influence, how each of our stories ends. Storytelling is an expression of our journey and the difference we'd like to make, and a way to build connection with others who can experience emotions that compel them to take that journey with us. So, what is your story? And more important, how will you tell it? Quite honestly, I can't wait to hear it. So, go on. Go tell your story. And, while you're at it, go on. Go help shape the future. To learn more about Gordon Locke and Pace Communications, go to paceco.com. That's P-A-C-E-C-O.com. Make sure to subscribe to Humans Now and Then so you don't miss future episodes that help inspire you to shape a better future. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this has been Humans Now and Then, hosted and produced by Rebecca Scott. Episode notes can be found at humansnowandthen.com. Thank you for listening.